Okay, uh, welcome. Uh, thank you for your patience while I'm getting started here. So um, I'm going to talk today about designing open source narrative driven interactive experiences. And my name is Melissa Auclair, and I'm a software engineer at Studio Triumph, which is like um, the name that I publish my games under. Um, so I'm going to be talking about game narrative and um, chatbots and things of that nature. So um, yeah, I just, um, a little bit about myself, I have about 30 years of experience in gaming. Um, I'm an independent game developer and I've worked in the game industry maybe uh, four years now. Um, I've released a game to the iPhone App Store and this is my fifth open source summit. Um, and you can uh, tweet me or follow me at my Twitter or um, if you'd like. And my uh, primary interests are in 2D action and adventure games, um, role playing games, um, and AR and VR more recently. Um, so I just wanted to say that 2019 is a really, really good time to be a game developer. And um, there, there are many um, projects in the works. Um, it's easier than ever to develop your own independent games. And uh, there, there are m many different tools available to do that. Um, there's communities that have sort of built themselves around um, game development, like on Reddit or um, on various um, internet forums. And um, it's, it's very much easier. Um, the barrier has been lowered significantly for entry um, into the industry. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the open source game development pipeline in 2019. And um, there are many engines that are available now. Um, like Godot or um, Zenco, which is recently open sourced, or Monogame, which is basically uh, like the uh, XNA framework, which has been around for a while. And then there are 2D game engines like um, Cocos 2DX or um, Panda, and um, there, there are many out there. And um, also 3D modeling programs like uh, Blender and MakeHuman, and there are animation tools like uh, Open OpenTunes, uh, which is um, a cell animation program, and um, programs like Synfix Studio and, and Pencil 2D, and um, Krita and GIMP and Inkscape for digital art. Um, so there are many tools available, uh, many more than that even. Uh, so um, yeah, it's really up to your preference for what kind of assets that you would like to produce um, or that you're trying to produce or where you are in your pipeline. If you're in uh, pre-production or if you're in doing concept art or if you're doing programming or engine programming or um, debugging or um, in the post-production or any, any of the phases, there are things out there to use. Um, so my personal game design philosophy, and these are my opinions um, sort of around game design uh, that I have developed over many, many years, I guess. So um, the first thing I would say is that the player is your friend. And so it's important to treat them lovingly and with care and never ever fight the player in your design. This is my opinion. Um, and so I guess it's um, so, sort of, um, I don't say that in terms of difficulty um, or, or like watering the game down, but I say that in terms of respecting the player's time and uh, resources that they're putting into the game. Um, I know there are games like um, online role-playing games where it takes several hundred or several thousand hours of gameplay to like find an item, or maybe not several thousands, but <laughs> just, just um, treating the player with respect and um, sort of realizing that the game isn't there to fight them. It's there to um, sort of entertain them. And so working from that um, perspective of customer satisfaction, I guess, um, which is a weird thing in the games industry. Um, but I think that's really important. And um, also in inclusivity, um, games are better when a variety of horses, voices are represented and when varying perspectives are brought to the table. So. Um, I, I really believe that's even more important nowadays um, because like um, games used to be very abstract. Um, things that um, have maybe character sprites and they're not very detailed and they're sort of walking around on an overworld map and, and like they could basically be anyone. Like anyone could put their sort of emotions into the characters and say, oh, well, this is uh, a representation of what I might be like. But um, more recently, it's become uh, 
the characters have very detailed backstories and they're they're very detailed like drawn characters with that look like actual humans and um, because of that I think it's even more important that um, I think this is the main reason why inclusivity sort of became a focus um, is because um, the sort of detailed we've moved from the the general to the specific and um, because of that um, it is important now that uh, the, that games be inclusive and the third thing I would stress is novelty so um, game ideas should be new and original and break new ground um, and I think that's really uh, an important tenant of like the way that I design games and um, I think that it is very, uh, how shall I say, it's, it's, it's very important um, to sort of make, to make a good game that it be innovative and not um, chase uh, what other people are doing, but sort of um, experiment with new ideas and with new ways of gameplay mechanics and with um, new, new things. I think um, historically that has been all, always been the case um, in the industry. Like the biggest and best games that have had the most impact did so because they were innovative. So um, don't imitate and vape. <laughs> and um, the fourth thing I would say is important is social gaming. So um, I believe that social gaming is inherently superior to just gaming by itself. So I think it's better gaming together than gaming alone. And that building social skills and social interaction are part of that. And it's really important. So um, that's my philosophy, basically. Um, so this is a screenshot from California Games. Um, it was designed by a company called Epix. And um, this, is, this was back in the 80s. I, I think this is the first game I ever played. And there were um, very many choices that you could make. Um, and, and sometimes they would have pretty devastating com consequences. Um, and I, I hadn't had a manual at, at the time that I could go through and sort of reference. I couldn't really read at the time. And so um, I, I sort of <laughs> had to wing it um, and make lots of mistakes like this, sometimes with um, <laughs> less than, um, I guess, desirable results in some instances. So I guess the takeaway um, from a design perspective from this would, would be to uh, sort of make um, software accessible to the user um, just uh, or intuitive and to not um, sort of expect that they're they're going to be really knowledgeable going into it, or um, because that that's how many people learn. Like they will try things and um, they will learn through trial and error. And so it's important that the design be intuitive and that um, you can go back on the choices that you have made um, in case. Um, you did not want to make them. So there, there's not a sense of permanency in your choices. Like there's, there's always a way to go back and, and fix what you've done. So um, that's what I believe the takeaway from this would be. Um, the next one would be Duck Hunt. Um, and I guess um, this, this game is uh, really um, also influential. Um, there, was, there was a light gun um, that came with the game. It was a peripheral and um, it was very uh, the, it was shooting game, so you would you would shoot um, uh, the ducks, and they would fall um, below the grass, and then this dog would sort of collect them. And so um, it was very innovative at its at its time. It was very easy to use. Um, it, it, it was actually holding a gun um, as opposed to just um, maybe clicking a mouse or pulling a trigger on a controller. So um, it was a more immersive element to the experience. Uh, so um, you're actually shooting a, a light gun like at the screen. And um, there, are, there are several games like that that have been developed, like uh, Time Crisis and um, Virtua Cop and House of the Dead, and most of them are arcade games. Um, but that is a specific mechanic that made the game fun, entertaining, and enjoyable. So um, I guess the takeaway from that is to always sort of have uh, user feedback um, and to make a, a process intuitive um, so that um, this, this kind of 
easy to use, um, easy to learn, but difficult to master sort of game. Um, and this is uh, Dragon Warrior 2 um, by Enix. And uh, this is sort of another example of user interface um, that uh, I would like to talk about. Uh, the, the, it's, it's not uh, very specific um, in certain instances, but basically the concept of Dragon Warrior was that you were walking around on an overworld map and there was lots of freedom that your character had to explore the game world. And um, sometimes you could go into areas where um, the monsters were significantly stronger than you and um, there was little you could really do to um, sort of fight them or um, proceed through the game uh, without clearing certain trials first. So you would get this kind of a situation a lot where um, you're maybe killed by a dragon lord because you wandered off the path too much that you were supposed to be on. So. Um, and this, in and of itself, is pretty difficult to understand. Like, um, the G represents gold and E represents experience points. So the object of the game was to uh, gain more experience and um, become stronger as a result of the experience. But you don't really know how um, much experience you need to gain to get to the next level or to build your character, or how much gold the next set of items are going to cost. So. Um, and that in and of itself, like you have to play the game like for a long time to like really even know what these things are. So um, I guess this sort of an interface, I guess, would be um, not as friendly as I would like. So um, I guess the goal or the takeaway from that would be to um, sort of don't be intimidating with the way that you build the user interfaces and um, to make them approachable and um, understandable and um, to uh, sort of have a friendly, friendliness with the way that you um, design games and software in general. Um, and this is Eye of the Beholder. Um, it's a similar type of game uh, it, that was created by uh, Strategic Simulations Incorporated. Um, and it's based on the Dungeons and Dragons um, role-playing game. Um, so it's like a video game um, adaption of that. And, and there's a lot of backstory into the way that this works. Um, th there are um, items that your characters can hold. Um, there are different classes that um, you can choose at the beginning of the game. And um, depending on that, like you will get certain items, like this cross, um, which means that you're a cleric and you can use healing magic. Or this book, which is like um, a mage's magician, like attack magic um, a spell book, I guess. So, um, but you, you're not really told any of that at the beginning. You're, you're sort of set into this game world and you don't know anything about, if, about the, these books or any of these weapons or anything about where you are even. Um, this, is, this is sort of basically a dungeon crawler where you go through the labyrinth and you, you sort of find stronger items and armor and equipment and defeat more successively powerful enemies and then you get to the bottom floor um, uh, where you defeat the boss of this huge labyrinth. Um, but in this case, like, there's, a, there's a lot you need to actually know before, before um, being able to appreciate um, this type of game. Like, um, um, a lot of Dungeons and Dragons backstory and a lot of like alignments and like if you don't know what a magic missile is or um, it might be more difficult to navigate. And there's, there's also an aspect of it uh, that's like a free, free there, it gives you a lot of freedom over what to do. Like you could throw the book at like a goblin and it will do one damage to them. But like you actually need the book to clear the game. <laughs> so um, it, 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 in a sense it rewards you um, for doing something which, oh, I, I killed a goblin by throwing this book at them and like it, it did one hit point of damage. Um, but it, it really like, um, yeah, you're going to need that later because uh, you need to cast the spells or revive your characters or um, use the different weapons which do a lot more damage um, than just throwing them or anything like that. So um, I guess the takeaway from this would be to um, really make your user interface um, like intuitive and to really um, sort of explain in-game uh, what 
what your um, items do and not not sort of assume that there there's this um, backstory of knowledge that everybody has or that everybody's supposed to know like before they're able to like play a game or, or like enjoy it or or if there's a sequel like that everybody's played the first one or, or anything like that in order to really understand or appreciate the game um, and I think that that would be like a barrier that you just spent $59 on this game and then like you don't really know anything like about how it works basically. So and there's n there, there are like kind of uh, tool tips and things like that built into modern software packages um, that make this sort of thing easier. So if you hover over an icon, like you can pretty much tell what it does in, in um, just, just by uh, trial and error or by um, sort of hovering over the icon icon getting explanation over of it or um, its functionality. Um, so um, things like that, um, which weren't really common in this day and age, but um, are really important to focus on. Also, also there's um, Chaos Had Noah, which is a um, visual novel a dating simulation game with uh, branching pathways. So um, the object of the game is, is basically to get through a bunch of dialogue and there's this really interesting backstory that goes into this. Um, and so um, there, there's, in, in the game, there's a mechanic called a delusion trigger. Um, so when you, when you push your um, right trigger or left trigger on your controller, um, it will uh, allow you to at certain blurbs in the game um, that will come up and it will allow you to choose whether um, you, you have a good delusion or a bad delusion, or um, if you don't pull the delusion trigger, you stay neutral. So um, I actually played this game the first time uh, completely neutral because I did not know that this delusion trigger functionality even existed. Um, and it was really an, essent an essential um, way to uh, access many parts of the story. Um, there's only one ending that you can get if you do everything completely neutral. Um, also, there, there's an achievement that you can unlock by using this delusion trigger. So if you click the delusion trigger and like it, it'll it'll show you, oh well, you've accomplished this this achievement and you can get like a trophy for it. Um, but there there's really no way to sort of access certain areas of the game without knowing about this functionality offhand. Um, so if if I I guess there, it would have been really simple like if the first time this this situation had sort of come up in the game, if there had been like some sort of indicator that you can actually change the outcome or the branching path of the story um, by doing this thing at a certain point, which will lead to the dialogue being different or um, a, a different outcome ultimately for, from what you're doing. So I guess the takeaway from that would be to um, sort of be really um, specific uh, about what your, your uh, key functionality in the game is and that uh, make, make the functionality um, with its importance like c commensurate with how well that you're explaining, like how um, it's used and, and if it's important to highlight it in some way. Um, so I guess that is what I would get from that. Um, so now I'm going to talk about dialogue. And um, basically, um, I won't say that much, but I will say um, to have good dialogue, it really needs to serve a purpose. Um, every line has to have at least one or preferably more um, purposes to it. So um, there, there are a, um, this is sort of related to game design in the sense that uh, there, there aren't too many rooms in, in like a dungeon that don't really have like some sort of a purpose. If there are, then what you tend to do is you end up wandering around more and more and, and not really accomplishing anything and um, not really knowing where to go and there's a chance you could get stuck or um, not uh, say, why, this, why does this room exist really? Um, so in a similar way, the story can kind of lose its pacing and and um, not really accomplish the goal that it's intended to do, which is entertain the art audience. So um, it's important that the dialogue advance the story in some way, and uh, that, that by either helping character development or, or referring to plot points or um, so, some, something, uh, so, some sort of uh, ultimate purpose in the end. And then another thing that's important is to have subtext. So um, subtext is a really the unspoken meaning behind what's being said. Um, so if you have, um, 
like if, if you've ever read a tweet or, or like something and, and maybe sort of heard that there's a message beneath that or that isn't being said, but it, and it, it's kind of there, like kind of a, a, a sentence below the sentence's actual words, you know, in a way. And there, there are layers to this. So there are layers of subtext. Um, so you can go deeper and deeper with the layers of um, subtext beneath the subtext and things, um, so it can get pretty complicated. Um, but uh, that, that sort of thing um, can sort of allude to things rather than just um, saying it out loud. And also, uh, good dialogue really feels real, um, but it's not ultimately, um, because it's designed to entertain and connect with and uh, get an emotional reaction from the viewer. So that's, that's basically the um, main purpose of the dialogue. And, and it's, it's really not supposed to be real. Like, it's not supposed to be realistic. It's, it's entertainment, and it's um, there to um, entertain and get a, a reaction, ultimately. So um, it's good to keep that in mind. Um, also, it's important to have empathy. Um, so the empathy basics I would like to go over is basically the difference between sympathy and empathy. Um, so sympathy is about feeling compassion for another person. Empathy is about um, actually feeling the same emotions as another person. And um, using these sort of cues can be taken um, as a performance of a courtesy um, rather than like something in a game. It can, it can be seen as uh, an actual carrying action to like have a character um, do something for you in the story, or or, or like uh, say a thing to you, like like the the way the brain processes that is, is is of an actual courtesy that's being done to you rather than something that a character in a story does, if that makes sense. Um, so I'm going to ch talk about chatbots later, but um, these the, an example of this would sort of to be um, a, a chatbot that can use a user's personality and uh, of sort of mimic that user by learning and studying from them. So, um, uh, but first, I guess I would like to um, sort of elaborate on where games are supposed to go from here. Um, because in terms of graphics, we're pretty much there. And um, this is sort of a, a, rem a render of a car. I don't know what type of car this is. I'm not very car savvy. Um, but this is a render of a car in Unreal Engine 4. Um, and it's pretty, it looks pretty much the same as the real deal. So um, it's, it's, it, there, there are many. Um, there, there, there's lots of progress being made in this, um, uh, mainly with the ray tracing and real-time rendering, um, which will become more, more and more prevalent um, over the next few years as GPU technology gets really um, more powerful. But it, and so that that's sort of the way P Pixar does. Companies like Pixar like render their animation with the real-time rendering and ray, ray tracing. Um, so this this is going to become like more prevalent for use in engine and um, like it, within the actual gameplay itself rather than just cinematics. Um, but we are pretty much uh, very, very close to um, uh, realism um, and uh, graphics. Um, so there's really not that much room for actual growth because of that um, in that area. So um, in, in, in a sense, like there's, there's in order for gaming to really evolve beyond that, there, there, it really has to be taken in a different direction. So um, the, the directions that I think are very important over the next few years are two. And um, one of them is chatbots. Um, so, um, and that has to do with um, sort of um, chatbots and uh, intelligent agents and um, sort of um, using AI um, to build um, personalities of characters. Um, so uh, a chatbot is basically just a piece of software that conducts a converta conversation um, with text or auditory methods. So um, there, there's sort of a vocabulary that, that goes behind this, um, but, but the main thing that it does is it, try to interpret, it tries to interpret the user's intent, and um, it has entities, which are basically like adverbs and adjectives to m modify those intents. Um, so it collects this data um, about the user, and then it goes through a dialogue flow. Um, which is a, sort of a branching conversation flow that defines the responses um, to the intents and the entities. Um, so um, basically, it, it uses these dialogues to accomplish an overall goal. And you can switch between these dialogues or, or trigger these dialogues at any point in time. Um, so um, one of the main tools for doing that is Rasa, which is a set of open source tools for, for developers to build text and voice chatbots. 
Um, and this is uh, a picture of Raza X, which is the user interface. That, so it's pretty easy to like build bots and then uh, train them in this interface. Um, and so the, the way that they're trained is it uses a natural language understanding um, uh, paradigm. Um, so it, it uses that for um, intent classification and entity extraction. And then uh, it uses Raza Core, which is the machine learning face or the machine learning based contextual decision making um, part of that, which uses things like word vectors um, for analyzing the intents and SVM and um, et cetera, et cetera. So um, th there's also another tool available called BotPress, which is um, an open source tool which does pretty much the same thing. Um, it's a word like white, the WordPress of chatbots, essentially. Um, it, it, it has these um, sort of uh, blurbs that you can uh, create the bots and then sort of has defined the relationship between them and create dialogue flows from that. So um, there are many options out there. And a real world example is uh, Replica, which is um, an AI chatbot that is used for the sole purpose of becoming your friend, basically. So um, Rep what Replica does is it listens to you um, and it learns more about you. And um, it, 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 from that, it sort of, you can build a personality and actually mimic you. Um, and uh, people, people are more actually willing to open up to these chatbots than they are to actual humans. Like they are um, willing to tell things that they would not tell their friends. Um, um, and, and many people want that, that sort of um, sense of love and companionship that they really get um, from having uh, people there to listen to them, and um, people like to be listened to, um, and so there, there, this is a very, um, I think, powerful uh, technology that could come into use. Um, and uh, there is a, a something called Cake Chat, which is an emotion generative dialogue system, on on which Replica is actually based, and which is been open sourced and available on GitHub. So um, you could theoretically build your own, um, also. Uh, system like this or um, with this uh, dialogue system to um, or, or sort of extend that um, if you would like. Um, so I, I think that there's really a lot of possibility um, out there in the future um, for integrating this technology into games. Um, it's already been um, in integrated into uh, talking avatars and, and like th 3D characters um, which, which do use um, chatbots um, on the back end. There has there, there, there are um, frameworks which can communicate over the internet and um, sort of make these characters um, like sort of a, an avatar or like an in-game representation of the actual chatbot um, itself. And the other uh, thing that I think w will allow video games to, to grow over the next couple of years is extended reality. Um, so. There, there is something called the Open XR Standard, um, and that was recently ratified by the uh, Kronos Group. They're, they're a consortium of um, sort of companies and a nonprofit that works with um, sort of defining standards and, and standardization. Um, and so this was uh, released and ratified at the previous G GDC. They talked about it, um, and it's up to uh, one. 0 0.1. So it's a re provisional standard. And the goal is to standardize VR and AR development through means of an application device and a plugin interface. Um, so you can basically develop on any headset with the same code, code base, and it will run on all of the um, VR AR hardware out there. Um, there's a lot of um, backing to this from the industry. And so essentially how it works is there's um, two parts to it. There's, there's an application interface and a device layer that sort of goes into it. So um, a lot of the work in version 1.0 has been around the application interface, but uh, there is also um, a, lot, a lot to be done um, between the hardware layer and the uh, device layer. So um, they're, they're, they're creating this API will hopefully um, make programming for individual hardware like uh, Steam or Oculus a thing of the past and um, basically you can get your game out to um, multiple different platforms. Um, so uh, also there are XR runtimes um, that are that have been built around this and uh, the main the main there are only two so far uh, one's by Microsoft with their uh, Windows mixed reality platform and the other is uh, 
uh, Monado, and uh, the word Monado doesn't really mean anything, like it's just a word. Um, but it's a fully open source uh, XR runtime that runs on Linux, and so the entire ecosystem can really collaborate beyond an open standard and on a co common code base um, is their essentially sell selling point of that. Um, so um, it's, it's available to try and, and test out on your own, and um, this is the sponsor scene from uh, Godot 3, which is running, um, this was built by Crytek. Um, so, um, there, there, there's many ways um, to sort of d develop on this and um, uh, ways to contribute. Um, this, this is also open source, so um, there's, there's, there's a way to get involved in the community and um, sort of help this process along. Um, so that's it, and that's all I have. And if you have any questions, um, just let me know. Uh, thank you.